This segment of WGCU's Local Untold Stories is underwritten by the Charlotte County Government Board of County Commissioners, Charlotte County Public Schools, City of Punta Gorda City Council, Charlotte County Airport Authority, and the Charlotte Sun. It was the year 1875. Ten years had passed since a bloody civil war had forever changed the face of America. On the western frontier, characters like Jesse James and Wild Bill Hickok were gaining legendary fame. Winding through mountains and over plains, the growing railroad industry continued to transform the nation. By now, westward expansion was well underway as Americans were looking for new beginnings and new places to call home on the rugged frontier. But not all pioneers headed west. Some went south to step into Florida's wilderness. Among them were Frederick Howard and his wife, Anna. They settled on the Peace River just east of modern-day Punta Gorda in what is now known as Solona. Later, Frederick's brother Jarvis, his wife Brenda, and their three young children followed. Frederick and Jarvis Howard uh, were young men who had been veterans of the Union Army in the Civil War. They were from Kinderhook, New York, and they came here with their families. From 1875 to 1877, Jarvis wrote detailed letters to his father in New York about their daily life on Florida's frontier, which he sent home via schooners and small steamers stopping in Charlotte Harbor. Charlotte Harbor, June 6, 1875. My dear Pa, on Thursday evening, both the Bonnie and the Santa Maria reached here from Key West, the former nearly two days ahead of the latter on the trip. Fred and I boarded the Bonnie and got letters and papers. Among other things, I received four different copies of The Sun relating to Lawrence the Smuggler. What a reputation that man is getting. I also found a couple letters from you up to May 21st and an enclosure of $5. Thanks for all the good things you sent. The Howards were hungry for news and supplies from home. Money, barrels of flour, books for the children, as well as clothing and other items, all arrived on different vessels coming from Key West and later Cedar Key. A few other homesteaders lived across the river from the Howards, but the nearest town, Pine Level, was miles away. To stay alive, the settlers traded, fished, and hunted. Their diet at times even included such fare as large loggerhead turtles. Charlotte Harbor, June 6, 1875. Last night we had turtle eggs for dinner turtle steak. Today we had more steak and eggs and have some left for tomorrow. A Spanish black man, about a week ago, sailed up in a small boat containing 300 clams. We bought 150 for $2.25, and from that time until Friday, just a week I believe, we had roast clams, clam soup, stewed clams, etc., alternating at each meal. Like other pioneers, Jarvis and Fred also farmed. They hoped to become self-sufficient, 
and maybe even make a profit from sweet potatoes and other crops. Thursday, June 24th, 1875. Still another clear morning and rainy afternoon. Make some potatoes in the morning and let nature water them in the afternoon. My hills begin to look green with the sprouting vines. I have already out some 300 or more and made 75 today. It is not quite so easy to break up new soil as to turn over old, but it can be done. You would hardly know the place, since I have dried up about the house and got my various trees started. By October, it will, if nothing happens, look quite potatory and very much advanced. I am preparing to set out some one-year-old orange and lemon trees and have several holes dug for other trees. Under my double window, I have a nice little garden spot and shall shortly set out roses and such beautifiers. The banana trees show two feet of stump and shoot up two feet higher, looking so thrifty that people from the other side are talking about the exceedingly rich soil at Jarv Howard's place, which pleases Jarv Howard immensely. Life on Florida's frontier was hard. Jarvis often wrote about what a pest mosquitoes and other critters were, and aside from a wooden box filled with medicines that Frederick brought from New York, there was no medical care to speak of in the immediate area. They had worms in the food, and of course Brenda had three very young boys all under the age of five, and there are frequent references to her headaches, which seemed perfectly understandable to me. Um, then they shaved their heads in the summer. There's some reference in the letters to that. I think because of lice, as well as the heat, but I think also because of lice. And I think there were some tender feelings that went along with that, that uh, Brenda, I think in particular, was upset by having to shave her head. For the most part, the homesteaders took the hardships in stride. In his letters, Jarvis refers to Florida as the Italy of America. He wanted their Florida experiment to be a successful venture. Nevertheless, the settlers eventually gave up and returned to New York. I'm not sure when Jarvis and Brenda and the kids left. Uh, I think they did decide to go back because, first of all, the hardship. I think Brenda was really not as enthusiastic about this venture as Jarvis was. But I think education of the children came to be a more significant issue. So I think that's what motivated them to go back. Frederick and Anna stayed longer, and they proved out 23 or 5 acres of homestead. And they subdivided and developed it into real estate and uh, sold some of that land to the railroad, which I'm sure was a nice return. Other settlers also started coming to Florida's southwest coast in the 1870s. As far as we know, the first settler who was in Punta Gorda was a family named Locke or Lockhart. They were from Key West. We're not sure exactly of their name. Uh, they would have camped on the beach in what's now Punta Gorda for some months, perhaps as long as a year. The Spanish name Punta Gorda first appeared on a John Christmas Ives map in 1851 and it designated the geographical location of the fat, flat point that juts out into Charlotte Harbor uh, and the present location of the western part of Punta Gorda, which is Punta Gorda Isles. However, it wouldn't be until decades later that a town by the name of Punta Gorda was established. In the beginning, there were only a few sparse settlements, but with time, more pioneers came to Southwest Florida looking for opportunities. Opportunity to uh, own land, and opportunities to raise cattle, and opportunities to raise citrus. They were generally people who were looking for a new beginning. Uh, perhaps where they were, uh, they didn't feel like that they had the opportunity that they needed, and this was uh, an area that was virtually unspoiled, and uh, the land was here for the taking, and many of them came uh, for that reason. My grandfather uh, came from Cloverport, Kentucky uh, with two mules in a wagon and wound up in Charlotte Harbor because he, uh, for financial reasons, he was a sawmill man. He came down in 1882, bought uh, a small piece of property up in what is now uh, Port Charlotte, cleared it, planted an orange grove, and two years later went back to Kentucky and brought my father and grandmother and, and my uncle and, and a baby sister down uh, into uh, Punta Gorda. 
Among those looking for a new start was James Madison Lanier and his family. They moved from Fort Ogden and became homesteaders in the area that would later become the town of Punta Gorda. We don't know exactly the year, but it was either uh, somewhere between 1879 and 1881. Uh, he came here because he was a hunter and a trapper, and his family often was alone when he was out in the woods uh, hunting. There were times when the Lanier family uh, burned fires at night in order to keep the panthers frightened away. And then on one occasion uh, when Mr. Lanier was gone and one of the children was ill, Mrs. Lanier had to walk the 14 miles from where their cabin was to Fort Ogden uh, with the child in her arms in order to seek the services of the nearest physician. So it was a very rugged frontier life. The Lanier's stayed on this property until they were able to claim their 30 homestead acres. Then in 1883, James Madison Lanier sold his land to Isaac Trebu, a lawyer and politician from Louisville, Kentucky. Trebu also purchased additional parcels adjoining his original tract. He had big dreams of founding his own town and eventually reaping the benefits of his Florida investments. He hired surveyor Kelly B. Harvey and instructed him on how to lay out the town. Tribu decided the entire waterfront would be a park and the streets, rather than running north or south, would wind with the bay. And 22 of the streets in Punta Gorda are named for Tribu's relatives. Uh, as in Marion Avenue was named for his father and uh, uh, Gill Street is named for a relative and uh, Harvey Street is named, of course, for the man who surveyed it. In early 1885, Harvey had the plat for the town of Tribu recorded. But for Isaac Tribu's town to be truly successful, it needed to be more accessible. At the time, the Florida Southern Railway had a charter from the state to extend the line from Bartow Junction to the waters of Charlotte Harbor. It was important to Tribu, as it was to community leaders all along America's frontier, that the railroad came to his town and not some other nearby settlement. Isaac Trebu not just played a critical role uh, in obtaining the railroad for Punta Gorda. Without his assistance, it probably would not have been built here at all because there were other choices where the railroad could have located other than uh, here. Uh, Isaac Trebu went to Boston and met with the officials of the Florida Southern Railway and made a deal with them to swap one half of his land in exchange for the railroad constructing their line to Punta Gorda. Now, this was uh, completed in 1886. Once the rail line was constructed, the town of Tribu became the southernmost stop on the American railway system. As it had out west, the railroad's extension made it more affordable to travel to remote areas like Punta Gorda. The Florida frontier town began to flourish. Well, there were a number of industries that uh, virtually sprung up overnight. Uh, one, of course, was uh, shipping, because they were shipping cattle and they were shipping phosphate and they shipped out vegetables and citrus as well. The railroad also made it possible to ship fresh iced seafood to northern states, boosting the local fishing industry. Tribu's growing population was involved in a number of business ventures. Well, there were local merchants, of course, there were people who were fishing guides, there were people who were commercial fishing, there were people in the uh, pineapple growing industry. In 1886, a post office, a church, and the first public school were established in Tribu. During the next year, the first newspaper began publishing. Around the same time, steamships widely used elsewhere gained in importance in coastal southwest Florida. It had the Morgan Steamship Line, which was established here uh, right after the railroad was completed, the Morgan Steamship Line operated between New Orleans, Key West, Punta Gorda, and Havana. It was not the only shipping line, but it was the principal one that operated here. But as the town continued to grow, tensions between the town's founder and namesake Tribu and the surveyor Harvey escalated. They uh, argued over what the fee was for the survey and argued over uh, whether or not it had been paid, and there was litigation over that. And, there were some uh, accusations that, uh, that Harvey had uh, falsified a deed and, and, and Trebu argued that Harvey hadn't done all the work and, and all this contentiousness uh, did overflow into the, into the community. So on December 7, 1887, 
a group of 34 men gathered at Hector's billiard parlor and drugstore to decide the future of their town. There was a public notice given of the meeting to discuss incorporation and to decide whether or not to incorporate or not. Uh, the 34 men gathered there, and four of them were black people who participated in the election, uh, and they voted to incorporate the town and to change the name to Punta Gorda. Then they uh, went across the Peace River in boats and then uh, walked from the shore of the Peace River to the county seat of Pine Level, which was then the county seat of Manatee County, which Punta Gorda was then part of. And they recorded the documents which uh, duly made uh, Punta Gorda one of the, th the things that existed, in fact, uh, and, in, and in law. Isaac Tribune resented the actions taken by the men. So three years later, he sought what he considered revenge. In 1890, when he was responsible for the appointment of a new postmaster, he recommended a fellow Republican named Robert Meacham. Uh, that was something that uh, was perceived to be a, a deliberate uh, insult to the people of Gorda. While Meacham was certainly a qualified person to be postmaster, he was also black, and the predominant uh, view of the people who live here would have been Southern, and there was resentment, but it was also felt that uh, this was something that Trebu had done deliberately to be uh, offensive to the people who he'd considered uh, his enemies in Punta Gorda. Uh, and that did not uh, engender uh, any favorable feeling toward the town's founder. Tensions between Isaac Trebu and the townspeople would continue until he returned to his home state of Kentucky in 1907. He died there a short time later. Once the city of Punta Gorda had been formally incorporated, its residents elected their first mayor and city council, which turned out to be rather diverse. We had five city councilmen, of which the mayor was one, uh, and four of the five uh, were not American citizens. They were natives of other countries, and uh, uh, they were permitted to vote, and they were elected to the city council. Only one was a native of the United States, and he happened to be a native of Florida. One of Punta Gorda's most renowned residents, Albert Gilchrist, ran for mayor in that first election in 1887. Gilchrist, who had come to the area as a surveyor for the railroad, lost. But his political aspirations were later realized when he served as governor of Florida from 1909 to 1913. The 1880s were a period of growth across the country. As was the case along many picturesque railroad stops in Florida, Punta Gorda, too, had a luxurious hotel that would attract the rich and powerful from around the world. A subsidiary of the Florida Southern Railway, the Florida Commercial Company, built the Punta Gorda Hotel, which had 150 rooms that had a commanding view of the bay, and that attracted a number of very wealthy and prominent people from all over the world, such as John Wanamaker, the merchant prince from Philadelphia, and Andrew Mellon, who was a, an associate of John D. Rockefeller, P. Lollard, who was a tobacco a tycoon. Frederick Remington was another one. He was a the famous Western artist who came here in the mid-1890s and sketched the cowboys and the tarpon fishing scenes. You did have tarpon fishermen coming here from all over the world, particularly from England. And there were over 20 books published in England about tarpon fishing in the Punta Gorda, Charlotte Harbor area. The seasonal hotel opened its doors in 1888, and to attract its first visitors, it hosted a sporting competition that had gained great popularity on the Northeast Coast. The owners uh, scheduled uh, a race between the two most prominent scholars in the United States, Tamer and Ham, and so they had the American Sculling Championship races on Charlotte Harbor as a, as a activity to help to attract people for the opening of the hotel. As the town grew, so did its social activities. You had a local music uh, provided by a local orchestra, and you had a number of different military-type bands with local talent that provided uh, music for uh, the hotel, they provided music for the steamboats, they provided music for uh, social entertainment. There were a number of uh, local organizations that promoted uh, literacy and uh, uh, culture and uh, refinement, uh, 
You had the, the Ladies Improvement Association, which was very active in doing things that were directly affected the quality of life in the community. They were responsible for the construction of the bathhouse that uh, was on one of the local piers. Despite the luxurious hotel and local beautification projects, not all of Punta Gorda represented glamour and sophisticated culture in the town's early years. Marion Avenue, which is the main drag, was not paved. There were uh, horse troughs for drinking. You had a town well right in the middle of the street. Though parts of town might have looked similar in many ways, Punta Gorda was different from other frontier towns of the time. Its close proximity to the Gulf of Mexico made the southwest Florida town a popular tourist destination and shipping center. Still, there were ways in which the frontier town resembled the Wild West. Punta Gorda was at the end of the railroad line, surrounded by mostly wilderness, hence attracting refugees from justice and other shady characters who created a climate of lawlessness. Between 18... 90 and 1904, there were between 30 and 40 murders in Punta Gorda. So you did have a, a rather rough element. Uh, while uh, alcohol was uh, legally prohibited, uh, you did have uh, what would have been called blind tigers. Later, they would have been called speakeasies uh, during the 1920s. Uh, so alcohol was available here, whether it was legal or not. But you also had the, the commercial fishermen, whenever they came in from fishing, uh, uh, after they'd been down the bay for several weeks, they liked to uh, enjoy uh, alcoholic beverages. And you had the cattlemen who were driving the herds of cattle to Punta Gorda to be shipped uh, primarily to Cuba. And they might have been in the woods three or four months. So when they arrived, uh, they liked uh, the libation uh, of alcohol. Uh, so you had that influence as well. In one instance, there was a shootout between the uh, city marshal and uh, the justice of the peace. Uh, so uh, it was a rather rough city. Sixteen years later, in 1904, a different city marshal, John H. Bowman, was determined to enforce the local ban on the sale of alcohol, an effort that would cost him dearly. Bowman was assassinated in, in the late afternoon in a home that he rented, which was on Taylor Street, where the old courthouse is located now. Uh, and he had four children, all of whom were gathered around him, and he was trying on bonnets that he had purchased for them. And someone then snuck up uh, by a window and fired at close range a shotgun blast that blew the man's head off in front of his four children. As was the case in towns along the western frontier, alcohol was not the only vice available in Punta Gorda. Uh, you also had uh, bothels here that uh, were utilized by men who were being paid uh, in cash and were away from home. Uh, and they thrived uh, for some time uh, during the, the rough and tumble days of early Punta Gorda history. At one time, there were as many as four brothels in town. One of its madams gained particular notoriety after her death. A person whose name was Big Six operated one of the bothels. In 1894, this individual died here, and at that point it was discovered that the Big Six was not a woman, but a man, which was a huge shock to virtually everybody. Big Six made news for years to come, and the story was popular lore on Florida's trains. The arrival of the railroad had transformed 19th century North America making it possible to transport fresh goods to destinations hundreds of miles away. In coastal areas such as Florida, the shipping industry also played a vital role in the development of an industrialized nation. When the railroad came to Punta Gorda in 1886, it had built what was called the Long Dock. The dock extended into deep water, Phosphate had been discovered in the Peace River Valley in 1888, and for several years it was loaded onto ocean-going vessels from Punta Gorda. But in 1896, that would change. After Henry Plant had control of the Florida Southern Railway, he decided to discontinue the, the Long Dock, thus denying Punta Gorda the ability to be a deep water port. And the, a dock was built called the Railroad Dock, which is only 1,200 feet, but it was near the Punta Gorda Hotel. 
and that became the center of the fishing industry as, what, as well as whatever shipping that there was done from Punta Gorda. But it certainly altered the, the nature of the shipping industry at Punta Gorda. While the removal of the long dock had a negative economic impact on the town, it didn't keep it from growing over the long term. As more people in search of the American dream discovered Florida, Punta Gorda continued to expand. My granddad came uh, about 1900, 1901. Uh, he was the uh, uh, first resident doctor in the area. By the turn of the century, many Southerners had made Punta Gorda their home. The town also included settlers from 27 states and 16 countries. Its population had grown to around 900. Most had come to Florida looking for new opportunities and with time, many more would follow. The early settlers' pioneer spirit allowed them to carve out a new life, and it played a vital role in taming one of America's last wild frontiers. To order a video of this program, call 1-888-824-0030 or visit our website at wgcu.org and please refer to the program number on your screen. <laughs>